I'm Kevin Davis, and this is the Catholic Family Podcast, and I am very happy, honored, and, well, um, overjoyed, I suppose is the right word, to be joined by a good buddy of the show, Mario from Novus Ordo Watch. It's always a pleasure to have him on, even though, unfortunately, it's usually to talk about some pretty crazy goings on with the Novus Ordo sect, but we'll get into that as, as we get going. We're going to talk today. It, there, it's, it's funny. I... I, I, I message Mario and I'm kind of giving him a hard time. It's like, Hey, when are you coming back on the show? You know, there's come on, we've got so much to talk about. Look at all this stuff, you know, yeah. you know, Bergoglio is saying, you know, he, he hopes there's not a hell or hopes nobody's in hell. The, the gay stuff, all, it's just like, it's every day. It's all the time. And, and um, anyway, we, we actually picked, that's all kind of so obvious that we actually are going to a little bit more of a nuanced topic. We're going to talk about a speech given by Michael Matt uh, at the Catholic Identity Conference, I think what was that a couple couple weeks ago now, Mario? But um, uh, that was in late September, early October. Okay, so so it's been a bit now, but we're going to talk about that. Mm-hmm. It's uh, apparently some some errors that he he goes through, and it's something that that um good to yeah to to bring to light and to to clarify some of the issues going on there. But first, as again every day there's something going on. There is yes. breaking news today. Breaking news today, and of course. Nova sort of watch does it better than anybody else. Uh, Mario, what what's the breaking news? What what craziness is going on in 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 Rome right now? Well, the breaking news right now is, and uh, this is a I'm quoting from LifeSiteNews.com. Archbishop of Canterbury leads Anglican Eucharist in Catholic Basilica with Pope's approval. Okay, now for those who are not aware, the Anglicans. Uh, and this is not just traditional Catholic teaching, it is also official Novus Ordo teaching, the Anglican clergy, the bishops and priests of the Church of England, in in the United States here they're called Episcopal, um, they do not have valid orders. They do not have valid ordinations, meaning their priests aren't priests and their bishops aren't bishops. They're all just laymen. And so uh, even according to the official Novus Ordo view, So uh, what happened today is that Francis allowed the highest uh, uh, ranking cleric of the Anglicans, the Archbishop of Canterbury, so-called Justin Welby, he allowed him to, uh, you know, preside over their version of mass, of the Eucharist, in a Catholic basilica. And if I'm not mistaken, it's even on the main altar. In other words, it's an invalid service of bread and wine. And uh, of course, it's also, I mean, it's the the worship. uh, Not only is it invalid, it's also the worship of a heretical and schismatic religion. All of that uh, took place today in the Basilica of St. Bartholomew in Rome with the permission of Francis. And to me, this is particularly um, interesting because just less than a year ago, I think it was in April of 2023, there was a similar incident at the Papal Basilica of St. John Lateran. Um, And some Anglican bishop, uh, Baker, I think was his last name, uh, offered also an invalid uh, Anglican Eucharist. And there was this big fuss about it afterwards, you know, this outrage, who approved this? How could this happen? Don't you know, we don't recognize them as valid. This is a sacrilege, yada, yada, all that stuff. And back then it was, it was clear that the um, Anglican bishop had some kind of permission from someone in or around the Vatican. Otherwise he couldn't have gone in there. And, uh, you know, then some people will say, well, did, did Francis know? Did he approve? Probably not. You know, and of course, you have the Pope's planers like Michael Lofton, you know, defending their man. Um, and this time around, it's clear that Francis has given his approval. And let me tell you, Pope's planing is a dangerous business model. It, it, it really is. You just uh, don't know. You may have to eat your words just a few months after you've spoken them. So anyway. That's the big news uh, right now. I can't wait to hear what uh, the Pope's planers and Novus Ordo apologists have to say about it. It's wild. It's wild. I mean, it's, it's something that, you know, I think you mentioned maybe before the show or saying that, you know, it's it's something that, you know, we wouldn't be, you know, we're, we're just saying the Latin Mass. You, or no, you're saying the 1962 Missile. So, so even to say the 1962 Mass, right. you have to get special permission. You have to get you go really go through all, you know all the ropes. Yes. Just they're to micromanaging do that. that, right? And, and 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 then on the other hand, you can be even recognized as not even having valid sacraments. And but hey, yeah, of course, come on in, come on in, guys. I mean, what's yes. next? What's next? I mean, I mean, seriously, I mean, 
I mean, this is crazy because obviously we know way back in the eighties, they, they're, they were, you know, putting Buddha in, in, the, in, in Assisi. So, I mean, I guess it's not that surprising, but it, it is still pretty, pretty. Well, although that at least, I mean, that was not, that wasn't like pre-approved and officially allowed. I think it just happened. And yeah, and, but I mean, bad enough that like, what, what are the Buddhas doing there anyway? You know, you sure. invited them. Right. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the, um, the the irony here is that if somebody wants to offer mass using the 1962 missile, the John the Twenty Third missile, it, essentially the traditional Latin mass, um, you know, they want to micromanage down to what you can can and can't say in your local bulletin about it. You know, it can't be in a parish church; it has to be whatever uh, in in a you know whatever in a warehouse or social hall or whatever a hospital chapel. I don't know, but you know. And, uh, and then when it comes to heretics and schismatics offering an invalid mass in which they offer to God bread and wine, uh, all of a sudden, no problem. Um, but it actually goes to show, and this is very helpful, that anything is welcome except what is Catholic. Right. Um, it's actually a great blessing to have such uh, clear evidence of that. Um, and you know the the traditional mass. Uh, if it weren't, um, if the people who attend it were all nobles ordo like the rest of them, I don't think they'd really care. They would just say, "Okay, you want your whatever Latin mass, go go and do that." But because those people adhere to the old catechisms, or at least they try to. And they represent the old church just as the mass itself does, because it is the mass of the so-called old church. They cannot tolerate it, right? They they tried it for a while. They said, okay, look, we don't want you all leaving. So here's your mass. Just be good Vatican II people and, you know, be in communion with your local bishop and all that. And, uh, of course, what the semi-trads did instead was not all of them, but, you know, a large chunk, at least here in the United States, that, you know, tried to make this like their the shibboleth of their great, uh, their, the narrative of their great restoration of tradition. And it's all going to go back eventually. And, you know, and uh, we just need to be, we need to persevere and so on. And this is the true church and Vatican II is wrong. And, and of course, you know, Francis can't, uh, tolerate that for very long in the Vatican II Church, right? From his perspective, if he's the Pope and Vatican II is magisterium and, and you know, and, and the Novus Ordo Church, all of that is is uh, is good and Catholic, then, yeah, they, they can't have a contingent uh, of people, uh, so to speak, hijacking their the traditional Mass and make it into uh, something that ultimately goes against uh, their magisterium and, uh, you know, the Vatican II church and, and, and all of that. So from his, from Francis's perspective, it makes total sense that he would suppress it and say no more. Crazy stuff. Well, you got yeah. I guess the, the, the question is, uh, can he actually be a, the true Pope? Uh, I guess that's the question. Now, now, now we are going to go get into the, the kind of the in between, you know, of, of all of this, yes. I suppose that recognize and resistors. And one of those one of the primary ones out there, one of the, the, the loudest voices is Michael Matt of the Remnant For sure. news, newspaper, I suppose, Remnant website, I suppose now. Um, but before Remnant we do that, I, I, I do want everyone to, um, I, I think we're going to be simulcasting this. We're going to publish this on, on Mario's page on YouTube, on mine as well. It may also go up on, on tradcast.org. That is Mario's um, podcast. Highly, highly recommend it. If you're not already <laughs> subscribed to that, please do. But, but I guess my point being, please, if you're listening to this or watching this on a Catholic Family Podcast, be sure to go over and subscribe to, to the Nova Soto Watch YouTube channel. Subscribe to the Tradcast.org. And if you're on one of Mario's, please also come over and subscribe to the Catholic Family Podcast. We're all kind of, you know, in, in this as a team together. And we That's appreciate right. we, we really enjoy and appreciate being able to do this together. But please, um, yeah, be sure to check out both sides of that so uh, Mario yeah I guess um where do we begin with this uh, Michael Matt and and his uh, speech in September yeah so Michael Matt is the editor of uh, the remnant newspaper it was uh, founded in 1967 split off from the wanderer um, over disagreements with the wanderer about what to do with Vatican II right I mean this, this whole traditionalist thing goes back uh, many many years. And the Wanderer decided to, uh, uh, you know, interpret Vatican II as conservatively as possible and, and tow the official 
line of the Novel Sword of Magisterium, and the remnant said, no, we're going to go against the error, clear errors of the council, and uh, we're, we're going to resist. So um, Michael Matt, as of late, has, um, for years now, uh, I guess, you may have heard him saying, you know, unite the clans, right? That is the, the big slogan currently, because Bergoglio has created so much confusion and so much chaos in the Vatican II Church that a lot of people are looking also at, you know, that maybe uh, 10, 15 years ago would have never um, considered any kind of traditionalism are now, uh, you know, reaching out to them and saying, hey, well, you know, maybe you've got a point and, and uh, can we, you know, like, what do you, they're, they're like looking at, um, you know, if maybe the criticism has been valid all these years. So there's a lot of people, um, that are very disturbed over Francis, that are just trying to be good and faithful Catholics, and they're they're finding, you know, what they thought was the Catholic religion, like it's totally disintegrating. And so Michael Matt is trying to uh, scoop up all those uh, different cliques and clans and 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 people and saying uh, unite the clans. In other words, uh, it's it's kind of an ecumenical sort of intra. How should I say, like a, a sort of traditionalist version of ecumenism, where uh, they can't agree on a number of things, but they'll they'll try to work together for the greater good in order to oppose uh, Francis and you know the Vatican II magisterium and all these obvious errors that coming that are coming from Rome. And although it is understandable on on a human uh, level, on a practical level, theologically, it's an utter disaster. And it actually helps to show that Francis is not, in fact, the Pope of the Catholic Church because he's not the principle of unity, hmm. right? Um, uh, the only one in the Catholic Church who does and can unite the clans is the Pope, right? Um, it, it, nobody else has that mission and uh, nobody else can do it. I mean, a, a, the bishop, a local bishop can do it for his flock. But uh, as far as for the entire church, um, you know, they now have, so they have people like our, this Archbishop uh, Carlo Maria Vigano, right? He's, he's uh, one a prominent voice nowadays. Then you got this ubiquitous Bishop Athanasius Schneider from Kazakhstan who always plays, uh, you know, like a papal corrector, if you will, and yet uh, has never been disciplined for anything by Francis, very curious. Uh, you have, of course, all the various uh, lay pundits and and whatever canceled priests and and uh, you know indult priests and SSPXers and so on. And you know they don't all see eye to eye on a number of things. Uh, some of them, you know, don't agree on whether the new ordinations are valid or invalid or doubtful. Um, right? Others will say, well, I think it's, uh, we have to resist ecumenism, but I don't have a problem with John Paul II's theology of the body, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, it's, it's a complete and total mess. And uh, so it's understandable that Michael Matt wants to unite the clans, but theologically it makes no sense. He also doesn't have the power to unite the clans because um, the only way they could be united is if they all recognize the same principle of unity. And if they all realize that they're in conscience bound to follow uh, and and to be uh, to to be unified on account of that principle, but that is only the Pope in the Catholic Church, and that's ultimately also how the entire recognize and resist traditionalism um, is really showing itself to be uh, absurd because they've by uh, by rejecting. And not so much by rejecting Francis, but by rejecting him while still maintaining that he is the Pope, they are entirely, um, completely uh, torpedoing what the papacy is and what the papacy has the power to do. So if, uh, like, at what point can you have a Pope again who who they agree uh, will be able to bind them? Uh yeah. But, you know, if it doesn't, you can't resist for decades and say, this is not binding, that's not binding, I don't have to obey that, and we need to resist that. You can't do that for decades and then uh, figure, oh, well, at some point there's going to be a Pius XIII, and then everything the Pope says and does is going to be 
uh, authoritative again. And then he heaven forbid anybody goes against it. Oh, he's going to be excommunicated. Well, meanwhile, you know, excommunication of Archbishop Lefebvre, ah, that wasn't valid. Or that wasn't any good. And, you know, you cannot do it. So they, they've actually destroyed any hopes of, um, uh, you know, ever getting out of this mess because their own theology will not allow it. So... It's no, it's great. It's, I, have, I have one question because I've actually sure. wondered this. And I think I know the answer, but when they say unite the clans, does that include say David Contes? I assume not, but, <laughs> but, but I, I've actually kind of, there have been some times I thought maybe some of them yeah. might mean it, which obviously, again, as you said, theologically, it doesn't make any uh, sense, but I mean, it's yeah. like, well, they're, who they're knows, all trying right? to rally around something. But as you said, it, what? Yeah. What, what, what are they rallying around? It, it, I, right. I'm pretty sure that, that Michael Matt, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I am pretty sure that he has said the word heretic and apostate on, on multiple occasions and then comes right back out and says, calls him, you know, we want, or, you know, we still have to follow the Holy Fathers. Like you just called him an apostate. I mean, yeah. uh, maybe it's someone else. I, I don't, I don't want to say he did said something he didn't, but I, it just, these things get well, silly. I, I don't know if he's ever literally said Francis, Pope Francis himself is an apostate, but if you imbibe, what he says, if you read what his newspaper puts out, um, you clearly come away with believing that Francis is an apostate, as you should, because he is, obviously. Right, right. Uh, but, well, you know, you're trying to analyze this rationally, right? So you're looking right. at this rationally and you're finding out it just doesn't work. Like you said, like unite the clans, haha. -ha. Well, you, you know, they're not even going to get agreement on which clans ought to be united. Yeah. Right. And um, no, it's not possible. You cannot have like a, another principle of unity um, if you reject the, the the Pope being the principle of unity. And, uh, you know, and then, of course, you know, we say to Vacantis, right, the objection will often be, well, you guys are not united. You don't agree on this and you don't agree on that. Well, there's a lot of things. Uh, uh, that is true where you have different set of accountants, a different set of accountants, priests, different set of accountants, laymen take a, a, a different position, but they're basically all issues that have arisen since uh, the death of Pope Pius XII. Practical considerations, uh, maybe questions about how a certain teaching or document is to be understood that maybe wasn't clarified before his death things like that but uh as far as what needed to be adhered to and believed um and uh done while Pius the 12th was pope there's no disagreement right and, and yeah, right so um and and we simply you know we're gonna it, it would actually be rather frightful if we said that there is no pope or no you know no pope we know of and nevertheless had perfect unity as if there were a pope that would be very troubling because it would mean that the Pope is not necessary and the Pope is not the principle of unity and that we have discovered some other principle of unity. Um, so the reason why you have instead of a kind of disagreeing on various matters is simply that the principle of unity is not there, right? Uh, but every set of a contest, uh, certainly you know, if you could convince them that there is a Pope, it would, God willing, whenever that should happen, please God, um, will certainly follow the Holy Father. Right. And uh, I mean, there's no question about that. So they can't really fault us for having disagreements when our whole position is saying that the principle of unity is absent. Right. Uh, what's really bad, on the other hand, is what the recognize and resist people do, and that is uh, they're insisting that the principle of unity is present and they still have chaos. Well, now you have no possible way of fixing it. Because what you find is that at the end of the day, each of them is his own uh, uh, final authority. And, and I'm not even saying that they mean to do it that way, but necessarily, if you, if you um, reject that which God has made the principle of unity, there's nothing left but yourself as the the final arbiter uh, of all these matters, right? It can't be that the Holy See um, releases a decree uh, declaring, uh, for example, now that Archbishop Lefebvre has excommunicated himself, and then you get a bunch of journalists and 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 lawyers or, or canon lawyers or whoever together and say, no, actually, he's not. Well, then who's going to be the final arbiter? Right. right? Vatican I dogmatically decreed that the papal judgment is to be disclaimed by no one. 
right? It is final and you, you cannot have, you can have recourse to the papal judgment, but from there you cannot appeal. And that only makes sense, right? Since our Lord said, what you um, bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. But anyway, I could go on and on. Maybe let's uh, let's <laughs> look at Michael Matt's talk at the Catholic Identity Conference. It was uh, called uh, Turning Persecution into Victory. And when I listened to it, there were just so many things, especially at the end, that I thought were so cringe that needed to be addressed, that we just need to give a reality check. Uh, because Michael Matt is a very good speaker. He can move a crowd and he he's, comes across as very passionate and very sincere and and I'm sure he is but um it, still the 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 theology that is um it, you know that is found in his talk and in many of his writings and talks is utterly atrocious and that's what I want to take a look at now Perfect. And before we get going, I just want everyone to, to be forewarned that I probably will stay mostly on the shared screen just because it's a bit clunky. So um, I'm probably not going to be going back and forth. So you'll hear um, me and mostly Mario talking, but we'll mostly stay again on this website over at the Remnant newspaper. Okay. Yeah. So this, this video is not available on YouTube. At least I couldn't find it there. It is available. Are we going to put the link in the show notes? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Wonderful. It is available at remnantnewspaper.com. And of course we can't go through the entire thing, but um, maybe start at the four minute, 41 second mark where Michael Matt talks about what the purpose of this conference is and is not. And yeah, go at 441, I'm sorry, 441 and end around 520. Got it. Sure, there are some people in this room who want to talk about is Francis the Pope? Is he not the Pope? This is not the purpose and point of this conference. That's above our pay grade. We can have those discussions. That's not the point of this conference. The point of this conference is to make sure that each and every one of us, when God intervenes and saves his church, which he is certainly going to do, the point of this conference is to do everything we possibly can to make sure we are in the church when he saves it. That we don't leave the church. Because we know there are people in the Vatican right now who would like nothing better than for us to leave. Okay, you can stop there. I mean, what, I mean, was this just insane or what? Um, you know, it's... It seems like, uh, you know, Francis, is he Pope? Is he not the Pope? Yeah, whatever. The only thing he knows is that he wants to make sure he and everybody else is somehow in the Vatican II church. Right. Um, because once God fixes it, you need to be in the church. I mean, this is just, what kind of theology is that? Well, and how can the church be broken? I, I mean, I, that's what, it's one of the things I don't, I just don't understand. Like, he, he is talking like... <laughs> The church, the bride of Christ, and obviously, and and the Pope are are broken. God needs to fix. It. I mean, woof that yeah. that that doesn't seem quite right it, to me. This is the problem. He's preaching a defected church, right? Right. That's what he's doing, and that's heresy. Uh, of course, if Catholicism could, if the Catholic Church could defect, uh, well, then that would mean that Christ didn't establish the Catholic Church, right? Right. Right. Or, or that Christ lied, which is a blasphemy and absurd and heresy. Um, and so it's it, it really makes you shake your head. Uh, so he says, oh, it's above our pay grade if Francis is the Pope or not. Well, uh, funny, he's okay with, like, you know, constantly rejecting magisterial documents. And that's not ab above his pay grade, right. right? He's got a whole newspaper full of articles against Francis and, and the Novus Ordo Magisterium and about the errors of Vatican II and the evil of the new mass or the problems with the new mass. None of these things are above his pay grade. But when it comes to the question of maybe the, the head honcho that is responsible for the entire apostasy, maybe, just maybe, the guy isn't the Pope of the Catholic Church, all of a sudden he doesn't want to talk about that. Right. Right. And he says, well, uh, above my pay grade, we can have those discussions. Um, what I'd like to know is when when do you ever have those discussions? Because I don't see them. I don't see them at the remnant. I don't see them in their com box. And I could be wrong. It's not like I frequent the com box there a lot. But I just the other day, I saw somebody who um, 
is not even a state of a contest, but uh, there was somebody complaining that the remnant had once again removed a comment from someone arguing uh, that Francis isn't the Pope. And I think this is somebody who believes that the last Pope was Benedict the 16th. So certainly not a state of a contest in the classic sense. Um, and uh, no, it seems like the, the remnant, the one thing they don't actually want to do is discuss whether or not Francis is the Pope. And it seems like, gee, if the papacy has any meaning, it's kind of an important question, isn't it? Right. I mean, well, does and, and Francis the crazy have... Thing, sorry, just even in this, it just it blows me away. He's, he's not even just talking about the Pope. He, he says in the church that Christ has to, or God's going to fix it, but you yeah. have to be in it. He's saying it has to be fixed. That That's wild. Wow. Yes. So he wants you to stay in a defected institution, and an institution <laughs> that with its laws and its teachings and its false saints and all these things is really harming souls significantly, leading souls to hell, objectively speaking. Right. He wants you to stay in it because, after all, when God intervenes and makes it all right, you need to be in it. I mean, this is just, this is insane. It's crazy. And, you know, Michael Matt isn't just anybody. Like, if, if this were just your average pew sitter somewhere just talking after Mass uh, about something, you say, okay, well, look, you whatever, you know, maybe uh, somebody who's, uh, um, you know, has a, a very, uh, you know, doesn't have uh, much of a background in theology or something, but Michael Matt is a newspaper editor. He's he's a spokesman, de facto at least, for uh, here in the United States, the, the, the people who consider themselves the remnant, right? right. The remainder of, of, of true believers, and, and he's putting out such nonsense. This is really bad. This is a real problem. And, and you know, sometimes people say, ah, oh, what do you worry about, Michael Matt and these people? Well, excuse me. Take a look at how many people they're reaching just by the numbers. Right. This right. is significant. You know, Michael Matt can put out like one of those remnant underground episodes. And in a few days, he's got 35,000 views. That's a problem. Right. You know, he, he's reaching a lot of people. And at this point, he meets with people like Cardinal Mueller and, and, uh, you know, Cardinal Burke and so on. And uh, I mean, they have uh, people like him have influence. They are they are not insignificant people. So that for him to to put out such theological uh, junk is a real problem. And uh, if you could, uh, um, Kevin, please forward to six minutes and seven seconds. And let's let's go from there to about 641. Still telling the stories of the Vendée. We're going, to start, we're going to tell the story again tonight about the Vendée. We're going to tell the story of the Cristeros this weekend, the English martyrs. Why are we telling the stories of people who were killed, who were murdered, who were martyred? Because they were victors, because they won. And we have to be sure that someday somebody tells the story of the traditional Catholics who remain faithfully in the arms and bosom of Mother Church through the worst crisis in the history of the church. That's us. Yeah. So um, somebody uh, needs to explain to him that the, the Vendée and, uh, martyrs and the Cristeros and so on, they didn't resist the Catholic Church. They didn't resist the Holy See and the Pope. Right. Okay. It's, in, it's, 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 ridiculous for him to uh you know compare himself to these or to their movement uh to those movements because uh, there is no they they were um fighting the revolution now i know he also agree he thinks of himself as fighting the revolution and in a sense you know he really is because of course Fa francis is part of the revolution but the problem and once again this is what throws a monkey wrench into everything is he thinks that's the, 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 the that Francis is the Roman pontiff, okay? And so by doing that, he's destroying everything. Um, and uh, so uh, let me just look at my notes here. Uh, so he talks about how we we you know we want to uh, stay with uh, faithfully in the arms of Holy Mother Church, while at the same time, speaking of being in the arms of Holy Mother Church, by the same time he's refusing to embrace. Noble Sorda Magisterium, the, the, the sainthood declarations, uh, the, the liturgical or disciplinary laws, uh, all of those things 
um, because he realizes they're poison. So which is it then? Is he going to be faithfully in the arms of Holy Mother Church, or does he not want to have anything to do uh, with Holy Mother Church? But then, of course, he would say, well, it's not really Holy Mother Church. Well, if it's not really Holy Mother Church, why is Francis why are you in it? Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I bet you I could ask my three-year-old daughter, and I, I could ask her, do you think that the church can persecute its faithful? Yeah. Did you did you think that you could uh, do you think that you could be persecuted by the Catholic Church? What do you think? Are you going to be a martyr? Are you going to be up there with you know your name among the martyrs because you were persecuted by the by the Catholic Church? But yeah. what do you think? What do you think, little three year old? I mean, come yeah. on, guys, this is this is insane. And so you wonder, well, what kind of catechism do they teach their children? I mean, they'd have to like have footnotes everywhere. I mean, like little asterisks everywhere, and say, "Well, not in this case, and not you know, not uh, if the Pope does uh, bad things and 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 all that." And it's just destroying the, the the traditional Catholic teaching on these things. So it's really uh, problematic and really annoying. Um, he, Michael Matt seems to think that being in Holy Mother Church simply means acknowledging the validity of the pastors that they're resisting, right? And declaring themselves to be faithful while actually being unfaithful to the actual living magisterium, right? Uh, I mean, if you look at the traditional Catholic teaching, it's always clear that the magisterium uh, or like that, that submission to the Pope, uh, you know, it means the current one, like the one like th that's now you can't say, well, I'm faithful to what happened in 1741 and in 833, I'm just not faithful to the current thing. Like it doesn't work that way. It's th that's why the church has a living magisterium. And by living magisterium, we don't mean it's a magisterium that, oh, today it says this and tomorrow it says the opposite. Uh, we, we mean it is the magisterium of the bishops, uh, alive today in communion with the Roman pontiff currently reigning. That's what that means. Now, we say to Vacanus, of course, we're, we're looking at what we have today. We say, well, I pardon me, but I can't see any uh, bishops currently uh, alive in communion with the Roman pontiff. Um, I won't say that there aren't any. I just, I, I can't figure it out. Um, and that's somehow that is the one thing at, uh, these recognize and resist people don't want to do. They would much rather have a defected pope and a fake magisterium and everybody for himself than not have an answer to what the heck happened. And it's it's very troublesome because they're they they are destroying all of the traditional Catholicism that they're supposedly trying to save. It is very frustrating. Um, so, and, and you know, this for, for, for these recognized and resist people, and, if, and this is where you had, again, different camps, right? Different clans. They did, um, uh, then come to that fork in the road where in 1988, where Archbishop Lefebvre was declared to have excommunicated himself along with the four bishops he consecrated and along with, um, Bishop Antonio de Castro Meyer, uh, from Brazil, who had participated in the consecration, right, of the four SSPX bishops. This is where some people said, okay, we used to support Archbishop Lefebvre, but we think he's gone too far. We will not enter into schism with him, right? Um, but of course, uh, the remnant, uh, you know, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm pretty sure I'm not, although the remnant was never an SSPX uh, paper or anything, they certainly did... Um, well, at the, at the very least, allow for the position that the excommunication that was declared uh, by John Paul II's, uh, uh, you know, congregation of bishops here, Cardinal Ganton, that that excommunication was invalid. Uh, and, and that's the problem, you know, uh, they're, they're resisting and uh, rejecting uh, whatever they think they need to in order to uphold their position. And even to the point of ignoring an excommunication and declaring it, not in a legal judicial sense, of course, but nevertheless, just, you know, preaching that these excommunications are false, null, void, and worthless, when in fact, the very authority that they recognize to be legitimate uh, has ruled otherwise. Uh, again, they, they're, making, uh, they're, they're making mincemeat of the Catholic papacy, 
and it's all destroyed uh, by by this. Ultimately, because they don't want to say that the Novus Ordo popes are not popes. Right. It's it's extremely frustrating and very dangerous. So uh, let's see. Can we go to? Yes. Let's go to the nine minute and fifty second mark, um, where he just briefly talks about. Archbishop Lefebvre as uh, like the last man standing. And um, yeah, go ahead, 950. Never had before. I just found some old video of myself when I was 10 years old, receiving confirmation from Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. I'd never seen the video before, we found it in the archives. And it was very interesting to look and to remember what that was like. Every bishop in the world had given into the revolution except for one. So I want you to remember that when we talk about some dark scenarios that are happening now, the synod on synod now, and some frightening stuff. Remember where it's... Yeah. So what he's saying, essentially, is that uh, the Pope defected, but no worries, Archbishop Lefebvre held the line. Okay? In the Catholic Church, in Catholic theology, there is one C that is absolutely indefectible. And uh, that is the See of Rome, the Holy See, the Apostolic See, the See of the Pope. There's one bishop who cannot fall, the Pope. Not Archbishop Lefebvre, not a retired missionary bishop from Africa, okay? Not the former Archbishop of Dakar, which I think he was. Um, so this right there is extremely troublesome and should trouble any traditional, anyone who considers himself a traditional Catholic, because that's an impossibility. If the, if the Pope, a true Pope, could defect uh, in the way Michael Matt believes Paul VI did, then we also don't need an Archbishop Lefebvre, because then it's all over, right? It doesn't matter then if Archbishop Lefebvre held the line. He's the wrong bishop, okay? Then that, that would mean that Catholicism has been disproved, and therefore you'd, you know, you'd have to abandon it all which, um, of course, uh, I just want to reiterate, no, Catholicism is true, the papacy is true, Jesus Christ really did found the Catholic Church. Um, the problem here is with the theology of Michael Matt and the recognizing resistors and the, the Lefebvreists. So, again, it is it is a, a rather absurd thing to say, to say that, oh, well, they all gave in to the revolution except Archbishop Lefebvre. Um, and of course, you know, I know that some people will come, oh, but um, St. Athanasius, like, well, St. Athanasius was with Pope Liberius. He wasn't against right. Pope Liberius. Right. Pius IX himself said so. I mean, he said, I don't have the document in front of me now. I think it was in the encyclical Quartus Supra, where he talks about the lies spread by the Arians against Pope Liberius. Um, so... Yeah, one C alone is indefectibly apostolic, and that is the C of Rome. But but it's interesting because I think it it shows as as it seems like every time we talk, it's it's clear that there is some something lacking in the catechesis of of the Lefebvres. I mean, of the R and R. I mean, it just seems like there's they they they, they don't. And I, I mean, this I don't mean to be uncharitable. Like like sincerely, I don't. But it just seems like there's just a misunderstanding of of indefectibility and infallibility and what is the church and what is the pope and we're not a democracy we're we're we're, we're not allowed to make up our own minds and to listen to podcasters and uh, and it, it just seems like that i think people just really genuinely don't understand that and i think that's again that's why i like having these shows i mean I, I think people think oh you're just being mean to the you know the to the r and r it's like well it's just trying to, to, to make it clear that you, you can't hold these positions. Like you really can't and be Catholic. Yes. How many more times are you going to uh, contradict traditional Catholicism and still call yourself a traditional Catholic? You know, and, and, and if those teachings uh, all come with an asterisk, well, why should anything else be true? You know, um, it's, they don't realize that they're undermining everything. They're destroying the foundation of everything else. Um, and that's not to say that state of Arcandism, you know, has all the perfect answers or whatever. Now, there, there's difficulties uh, in our position that, that are just difficult to resolve. But for some things, you just simply have to be uh, able to say, I don't know. You know, God has apparently seen fit to shroud it in mystery 
And uh, faith is not based on figuring everything out. Faith is based on the authority of God. And, um, you know, the least I can do, if, if, if God gives us the infallible assurance that the Roman pontiff cannot defect, and yet it is clear as daylight that Francis is an apostate and, 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 and teaches apostasy to the entire church, well, then I have to conclude that he's not the pope. Okay, even if I don't know how the next conclave is going to happen or or whatever, right? It, it, we, we can't uh, allow those difficulties to say, oh, well, in that case, maybe then we'll just say he is the Pope and uh, somehow none of it matters. It, it's insane. And it, it's, it's also very, I mean, it's very serious because people really do harm their souls, whether they're in innocence about it or not, is, is uh, irrelevant. Like, if you follow the Novus Ordo Church, if you follow the teachings of Francis, uh, you are not going to, well, I mean, be careful, but it, it is very unlikely that you will die in the state of sanctifying grace. Not because you're, you're guilty or whatever, but because Francis places virtually no emphasis on uh, the, the, the life of grace and the reality of hell, and, um, you know, all of these things, and he does not teach you the true faith. In fact, he constantly attacks the virtue of faith uh, frequently. Um, chances are you're not going to die in the state of grace. So th these things these things matter. See, some people think that if as long as they affirm Francis is the Pope, all is well. Uh, uh, no, no, because other people are going to see that. Oh, well, then Francis really must be the Pope, so I'll follow him. Um, it really does make a big difference. Um, it, you know, th these things matter, right? So people shouldn't uh, conclude that, oh, somehow it's the safe position to say Francis is the Pope. It's not safe at all. In fact, uh, because we're, I mean, we're, we're rational animals, right? We, we are logical beings. Uh, eventually logic always wins. And so it can't be that the Catholic church is the ark of salvation. And then somehow, uh, you can't follow it. Well, and, and couldn't I logically conclude today that I can go to England and uh, attend a, a an Anglican service? Right. Yes, I mean, exactly. logically, can, can can I say, well, I mean, the Pope approved it to be done in a in a basilica in Rome. So yes, you you could you could conclude that at the very least, it can't be so bad that you're going to lose your soul over it. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. And yeah. yet. St. Thomas More preferred to lose his head over it because he knew that the only other option would have been to lose his soul over it. Right. And he wasn't going to do that. Um, so it, it's, yes, all of these things are very serious. And before I forget, in 2017, and we can provide the link if people don't believe it, in 2017, Francis was one of those uh, Q&A sessions, questions and answer sessions with, I think it was the clergy of Rome, and, you know, he's, of course, always talking. And uh, so at some point he said that, well, if there is no uh, Catholic mass available, it's a day of obligation, you know. And if there is an Anglican service, just go to the Anglicans instead. That's what he said. Yes. And uh, in another occasion, many years ago, I think it was 2013 or 2014, he said that the Catholic Church needs Anglicans as Anglicans. Okay. In other words, no, he didn't mean, well, he wants Anglicans to convert to Catholic. He doesn't give a hoot about these things. No, he specifically said, because I, I, I don't remember the context, probably diversity or something, that they need Anglicans as Anglicans. It is a, a gigantic mess. So, um, But maybe we can fast forward, uh, Kevin, to the 12-minute mark where Michael Matt demonstrates what he understands... Uh, humble submission to the Holy Father to be like. Did you really think that we were going to lay over, just roll over and take it again? He's addressing Francis here. Did you honestly yeah, think after the spiritual and moral destruction of our country, of our world, of our families, of our children that followed in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, and the liturgical experimentation that has now led to 80% of Americans no longer believing in the real presence of the Eucharist. Did you think 
and we were going to try this again. Yeah, uh, roll we will through uh, twelve fifty five. By the way, Gosh. I just want to say real quick something about this. Whenever this comes up, the eighty percent uh, or whatever it is that don't believe in the pre in the real presence. Well, you know what? Those people are actually correct with regard to the new mass. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Right. That's, that's the thing that always gets missed. Right. Um, but anyway, go ahead. Comply. Before God, God as our witness, we will not comply. We cannot comply. And that's going to mean, friends, persecution. All right. So it does sound a little bit like Martin Luther's here I stand. I can do no other. Right. We will not comply. We will not serve. Look, I understand. Of course, he's 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 trying to defy the revolution. But again, the problem is, it, in in his uh, world, the revolution is coming from the Pope. Right. And 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 now you have a complete and total mess, uh, theologically, for for for, uh, for you to affirm something like that. So, in any case, what you just heard there is certainly not. Uh, the necessary humble submission to the Pope, to the Holy Father that is required of every Catholic. And again, if you look at the traditional Catholic teaching, it is not that, oh, we have to humbly submit simply to scripture and tradition. No, it is specifically to the Holy See, to the majesty, to the official acts of the Holy See. So it is a clear contradiction to say on the one hand, you're a traditional Catholic, and then on the other hand, to say that you're uh, accepting Francis as a true pope, but you're going to resist him. The, the two simply can't go together. And now, um, Kevin, if you could go to the 2313 mark, and let us hear that through 2347. 2313. This is where Michael Matt tells us not to leave the Vatican II Church going to look like oh are we gonna are we gonna are we gonna become discouraged and just leave the church the church right now if you think of it in terms of holy mother church is being scourged in a way i think we'd be hard pressed to find any precedent for in history that's our mother being scourged what would you do if your real mother would, was being scourged, your actual physical mother was being scourged? You wouldn't leave. You wouldn't go off and start another family somewhere with a new mom. You gotta stay and do whatever you possibly can to comfort her. I remember, this isn't exactly relevant to the, the okay, image of mother, but I remember hearing. Yeah, well, you know, if you were to ask Francis or I don't know, Cardinal Supic or uh, just your average Novus Ordo bishop, they wouldn't agree that the Catholic Church is being scourged, not at all. Or if if she is, she's being scourged by people like Michael Matt. Right. Um, so again, you have your private judgment here about something, and uh, it is, of course, only being used as an argument to keep people attached to Francis. Right. Um, the state of a contest is not leaving the Catholic Church. The state of a contest is um, understanding that if he used to be Novus Ordo, that that wasn't the Catholic Church because it's doing things the Catholic Church cannot do. Um, it's leading him astray. It's leading him to hell. Um, how could it be the Catholic Church? I mean, what a blasphemy it would be to say that. And um, and somehow, though, you know, with all his unite the clans and let's, uh, you know, uh, you know, tolerate very, uh, different views and stuff, somehow they won't accept that one, right? Um, I mean, it is rather important, isn't it, to know first if Francis is the Pope or not, and if the church he heads is the Catholic Church or not, because see, because um, Michael Matt is trying to have it both ways. Okay. Uh, you know, recognize and resist. And then, but heaven forbid, you should leave that church. I should say, people who uh, read The Remnant will know this. The Remnant often, well, I don't know about the recent past, but at least in the past few years, has had articles in which their columnists talk about the new church, the Vatican II church. And boy, 
do they have some choice words for that church? In fact, let me see. I've got an article here that I wrote about it in 2022, and it is called Denouncing New Church, Another Theological Train Wreck from the Remnant. And uh, this is in response to the article, The Tragedy of New Church, which appeared in The Remnant on February 10th, 2022, written by Jason Morgan. Uh, so, and here he is writing, you know, for example, these are, these are just bits and pieces from the article by Jason Morgan. Uh, New Church was born pro-choice. It was born in schism, rupture, chaos, duplicity, misdirection. Uh, and I'm skipping around. New Church is the Vatican II sham show on repeat forever. The Catholic faithful have been asked for nearly 60 years now to suspend disbelief and to pretend that the Novus Ordo, the new Coke version of the real thing, is the equivalent somehow of the actual mass. Um, new Church is mockery, a mock-up of Catholicism. New Church's God uh, is uh, diversity. Um, he talks about Francis being a very anti-Catholic pope. Um, the Vatican hates most that which it professes to but cannot control, the body of Christ. Uh, it is setting up a false mass in place of the real mass. Uh, the Vatican exiled itself from the church. That exiled camp of lost souls is new church. Francis may be the Antichrist. Um, if new church were to turn around and rediscover what it abandoned, it would stop being new church. Um, and so I then went ahead and uh, kind of um, summarized uh, essentially what all the diff different designations or the different things that Jason Morgan was saying about new church. Um, I made a list of all those things, and let me quote from that now. Um, so he's Jason Morgan in this piece is essentially saying that New Church is inherently contradictory, is a humanistic, man-made institution, has a modernist identity, thwarts or destroy or destroys the good that men would do, is not the Catholic Church, was born in schism, rupture, chaos, duplicity, misdirection, and bifurcation, is a sham is a mockery, a mock-up of Catholicism, has diversity as its God, just like Satan, compels the Vatican to persecute Christians, has set up a false mass in place of the true mass, is an exiled camp of lost souls, may be the ape of the Catholic Church, is a stand-in for the real church, and has a pope that may be the Antichrist. Folks, this, this was published in The Remnant. And what does Michael Matt tell us now? Can't leave the church. Right. Be nice to your mother. That, that doesn't sound like nice Be words nice to your mother. Uh, that sounds a little harsh. I, I think that's a, but yeah, but it's exactly, it, it's so, it's just, it's absurd. I mean, I agree oh. with everything that guy wrote, but, but then you can't go, oh. I, you can't go and say all that and then turn right around and like, oh, but don't leave it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's again, that's the, that throws a monkey wrench into everything. So, um, it, no, you know, Michael Matt is using a wrong analogy. He's like, oh, the church is being scourged. No, according to you, the church is doing the scourging, right? Right, and she's persecuting her own people. So, but see, there is no, there is no clarity and there is no real Catholic theology in what Michael Matt is saying. That is the problem, and um. It is a problem because this is a fundamental, uh, fundamentally a theological uh, uh, matter that we're talking about here. Okay, so you can't just approach this with uh, a little bit of common sense, a little bit of emotion, a little bit of popular piety, something about the martyrs. You, you have to at least be clear on what is the traditional Catholic teaching, and what does it look like if we apply this to uh, the facts at hand that we're encountering here every day? And so the only conclusion you can have uh, that, that is reasonable, that is logical, uh, is either the Vatican is not uh, persecuting the faithful, the Vatican is not putting out harmful, evil laws and teachings and the heresy and all that stuff, or if it is doing that, then it's not the Catholic Church. Um, and that's why uh, you have, you know, you know, on the flip side uh, of this is, you know, a website like where Peter is, where they recognize 
the papacy cannot spew all this stuff, uh, cannot spew heresy and impiety and, and false saints. And so they conclude, well, therefore, all of this is good and true and holy. Okay. But of course, that's absurd. And it is not compatible with what went before, which which the, the people themselves, like the, the 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 Vatican II modernists, are at times rather candidly happy to uh, tell you. So, um, but so no, this you know it is a very emotional argument, but it's a false analogy to say that the church is being scourged. Uh, well, the church is being scourged, but in, according to Michael Matt, it's actually the church doing the scourging, right? And so uh, oftentimes the, the passion of the church is being invoked as a metaphor for what's happening. And I would agree with that. There is a mystical, the, the mystical body of Christ is undergoing uh, its passion, uh, just like the, the physical body of Christ, our Lord Jesus himself underwent his passion 2000 years ago. Uh, but in that mystical passion, the Pope is not Annas and Caiaphas. The Pope is not Pontius Pilate. The Pope is not Judas. The Pope represents our Lord. He is the one being persecuted. And um, you can see, uh, for example, in the encyclicals of the mostly the 18th and 19th centuries, when the Popes spoke about the persecution, the, the uh, persecution of, of the, um, what do they call them? secret societies and and uh, whatever perfidious sects and so on that were definitely um conspiring to persecute the mystical body they, they the popes always said that it is specifically the apostolic see that they have in view right they because they they knew that if they wanted to conquer uh, if they wanted the revolution to prevail over the catholic church they would need to destroy the chair of peter but the chair of Peter cannot be destroyed because it is of divine institution. Never would it be the case that the chair of Peter is now teaching the revolution, is now on the side of the rocket. Then it would have defected. Then they would have truly conquered it, which is precisely what is impossible, right? The gates of hell shall not prevail, said our Lord, and the gates of hell are uh, the, the, the disputation of heretics, um, that is what is meant by the gates of hell, right? right? Which only makes sense um, that unlike any other human institution, this one, the Roman Catholic Church found, find, founded by our blessed Lord, this one would not be conquered by, um, uh, by heresy, by schism, by, uh, you know, all kinds of unbelief and, you know, impious um, ideas. And uh, so therefore, given the current situation, the only thing we can conclude is that the chair of St. Peter is vacant, or at the very least, it's not lawfully occupied uh, and it's not validly occupied by the Argentinian squatter in the Vatican guest house, Jorge Bergoglio, uh, a.k.a. Pope Francis. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I think you you need to see if you can get an invite to the next uh, Catholic um individuality mm. conference whatever it's called identity, con yeah, identity, identity conference, conference, the, conference yeah. identity crisis conference I, 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 but if you do i want to i want to see you get as riled up as michael matt you know really get out there and give it yeah to um <laughs> sure well sure <laughs> next year we'll see if that happens um so that's why it is so important to understand that you can't just uh brush it off and say well that's above my pay grade um Honestly, is it really above your pay grade to say that the man who's doing things Christ promised the Pope would not be able to do, that he's therefore not the Pope? That's above your pay grade? Really? I find that amazing. And then, but n n nothing else, right? You're uh, you're doing like Catholic identity conference. Well, you know, the Catholic identity um it's very easy to verify your Catholic identity. Well, <laughs> nowadays it's not so easy, but uh, your Catholic identi identity would be verified by uh, looking, are you in communion with your local bishop? And is your local bishop in communion with the Roman pontiff? If so, there's your Catholic identity. You know, identity, that's, it's been verified. And, but what are these people doing? You know, th their Catholic identity conference, I guarantee you did not have the approval of the local bishop there. I forget where it was, I think somewhere in Pennsylvania. Um, and so they have to turn everything on its head and somehow say that, well, well, we're the, the really faithful ones, you know, um, 
And it's it's going to get more interesting as uh, Michael Matt keeps going in this uh, presentation. And uh, help me out. Where did we stop now? Uh, twenty four. But real quickly, I mean, I'll, I'll yeah. head over to that. But but why why is it that these people aren't? I don't know. Maybe not excommunicated, but it doesn't seem like Bergoglio or anybody even says anything. They have this Catholic conference with big names and they go and go and say, we're going to, we're going to fight the church and we're going to fight the the Pope and mm -hmm. nobody cares. I, I just say, I, I guess it, I just imagine this back in the 1940s or 1840s, whatever, if mm -hmm. someone, you know, some layman newspaper guy was out there, Catholic newspaper editor was saying, Hey, we're, we're going to fight tooth and nail the Pope. I, I would imagine you would get censored and get in trouble real quick, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I can't, I, I, I don't know. Um, I remember last, no, the year before last year, in 2022, uh, I think the uh, the guys from The Pillar, PillarCatholic.com, they went to that identity conference and did some reporting on it. Uh, maybe maybe one other outlet or so, but that was it. Um, I, I don't know. I think they probably figure it's better they don't even bother covering it. This mm -hmm. way they don't have to, because who knows, Some somebody might, figure out that maybe there is a difference between pre-Vatican II Catholicism and post-Vatican II Catholicism. I don't know. I just don't know. But um, crazy. Oh, let's see. Oh Can boy. we? Uh, I, I lost. I actually lost our place. But I think we we okay. did twenty. No, that's okay. We need to go. Let's go to twenty-seven thirty-one. That sounds right. Okay. which at the same time is the point and purpose of why we're on this earth to begin with. No love and serve God. That's all it is. That's why I'm not a big fan of this big discussion about Francis. Is it the Pope? Isn't the Pope? I don't know. We'll work that out. People with authority will work that out. But what we have to do as the clans of tradition is keep the faith and stay together. And what we have to do is recognize and acknowledge that right now, <laughs> this is where it gets really interesting. There is no other solution. Okay, you can stop there. There's absolutely yeah. Again, they're like yeah, whether Francis the Pope or not, who who knows? Who cares? Uh, yeah. Well, he can say that because he doesn't submit to him. <laughs> That's why he doesn't really care. Okay, but if he is the Pope and you don't submit to him, it's kind of a problem. It's uh, called schism. You know, uh, it is beyond me how somebody can say, uh, well, well, somebody else will figure out as if it were simply an academic theoretical issue, something for you know, clever academics to, to duke out uh, decades from now, you know, um, it's kind of like, you know, as if, if, as if it were a matter of, well, did the Franciscans in the 15th century, did they wear this color habit or that color habit, you know, something that doesn't make right. a difference uh, ultimately. But this is, uh, as I think we've been demonstrating here, it is of, uh, of the greatest importance to know whether Francis is the Pope or not, whether he is divinely assisted by the Holy Ghost or not, uh, clearly not. <laughs> and everybody can see that, but then some people just will say, no, it's above my pay grade. Uh, meanwhile, refusing him submission is not above their pay grade. Um, now, Michael Matt said, well, look, we're here on this earth to know, love, and serve God. Okay, that's true. But you can only do that properly, objectively, in communion with the Roman pontiff and in union with the Catholic Church as a Catholic. See, you cannot, you cannot escape the papacy. You just cannot escape that issue. Um, and I, I know it's a popular one. That, you know, a lot of people will say, well, let's just leave the Pope issue aside and well, let's just be, let's just practice the faith and and be good Catholics. But you cannot do it. It's it's because you can only be a good Catholic if you adhere to all the dogmas uh, of the faith, all the doctrines uh, of the magisterium, okay? So you cannot escape the issue. You cannot set it aside and say, you know, oh, here's the faith, and then over there's the issue of whether Francis is the Pope. No, they're intri intricately linked. And of course, it's not just a question of Francis, but also Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, John Paul the uh, Second, Paul the Sixth, and John the Twenty Third. John Paul the First doesn't really matter. It was 33 days, but... Uh, no, I don't think he was the Pope either, but uh, I'm just saying like sometimes people, like, oh, what about him? You know, like it's irrelevant. Um, so no, you know, 
we need to stop acting as if uh, the status of whether Francis is the Pope or not, whether that is a side issue that uh, is kind of like a luxury issue that we can leave to others uh, to determine. Meanwhile, we'll just, you know, reject the entire magisterium and all the stuff and uh, that coming out of the Vatican, like, well, if he's the Pope, then that's not, uh, that's not uh, an option. Uh, further on, Michael Matt says that nothing on this earth could make us abandon the faith. Well, hopefully, so. well, you know, by God's grace, uh, nothing on earth can make us abandon the faith. Um, but of course, as I think we've shown, he has already abandoned it. I mean, he's, you know, not willing to really engage uh, the issues uh, because he might conclude that Francis isn't the Pope and he doesn't want to, and he doesn't want to do that. Um, so it's it's very tragic, but you can't. I mean, the papacy is part of the Catholic faith. And if you don't want to abandon the faith, well, then you need to adhere uh, to the papacy, to what the Catholic Church teaches about it, and uh, what she teaches about submission to the Roman pontiff. So, you know, it, it's, it, you can see there's a lot of contradiction in Michael Matt's talk, and I'm, I'm not questioning whether he means well or not. It has nothing to do with that. Um, it, we're, we're strictly going by what is being said. And you know, again, it's affecting a lot of people. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many participants were at that so-called Catholic identity conference, but I'm pretty sure it was at least 700. So it's a, it's a pretty good crowd. And, um, okay, now we, let's get to my favorite part, the, like the last 10 minutes or so of, of the uh, talk. So he talks about, Michael Matt talks about how he's going to interview Cardinal Gerhard Ludwig Muller the uh, following day. And uh, please go to the 3340 mark and uh, we'll play it until 3504. Don't matter 50 years ago. So there's a human consolation and there's a divine consolation. We'll talk about that all weekend long, but remember, think about it in your conversations, Gerhard Cardinal Muller was the head of the CDF, the top theologian in the church just a few years ago. He is going to grace us with an interview tomorrow night. And, and as, as we draw nearer to that, I think it's very important to, to recognize that for what it is. That's not just a really famous cardinal who's coming to the CIC. That, my friends, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, letting every one of us in this room know, and all around the world, that if you stay faithful to him, he will find ways of showing that he is still in charge of his church, that he has not abandoned us, that we are not alone, that we have bishops and priests, high-ranking cardinals now, who are saying, go get him. What did, what did Cardinal Muller say so famously last year? That this, what they're doing, represents a hostile takeover of the Catholic Church, that if they succeed, it will be the end of the church. And then the most important thing is those next few words from Cardinal Muller. He says, and we must resist. <clears throat> yeah, you can stop there. I, I mean, again, you know, very passionate, very emotionally appealing uh, perhaps but uh, theologically an utter disaster w what was he saying uh christ is letting us know uh that he's still in charge of the church because michael mad can do an interview with cardinal muller <laughs> <laughs> really like okay so wait a minute so the holy see you know they've got uh, homo couple blessings they've got whatever um uh uh, the Abu Dhabi heresy and all that, where God wills all religions and they're doing, you know, whatever the Jews have their own valid covenant, whatever it is, all this stuff. But when Michael Matt gets to interview the former head of the Holy Office, it's uh, Christ letting us know he is in charge of the Novus Ordo Church. I mean, it's just, does this make any sense? This is what I mean. Like, we need a reality, like a, yeah, a reality check on what Michael Matt says, because he says a lot and it's, it usually goes unchallenged. And um, we should probably remember here, 
who Cardinal Muller is. So we found out since Amoris Laetitia, or mm, a little bit later, actually he defended Amoris Laetitia, I might add. Uh, okay, so Cardinal Muller does not like adultery. Well, that's good. That does not make him a Catholic, though. Um, Cardinal Muller is on record denying the bodily resurrection of Christ. He is, on, in, in, in his theology books, he is on record denying uh, transubstantiation. Uh, and he's on record denying the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, as defined, okay? I'm sure he believes in some kind of idea of the perpetual virginity, but that's not good enough, okay? So uh, I, I've got here some quotes from Cardinal Muller. Now, he um, wrote his uh, theology books in German, uh, and some of them... Are, are beginning, you know, they're, they're starting to translate some of them. And it is very difficult to translate because Cardinal Muller, he's a disciple of, of Karl Lehmann uh, in Germany, the, who in turn was a student of Karl uh, uh, Rahner. And so it is it is just an awfully convoluted um, body of, of, of text that, that has to be translated. And um, what I did was I looked at some of what he had written in the last 20 years or so on the Holy Eucharist, and I translated it myself. German is my native language, so I can do that. And I tried to be as, as literal as possible. Um, and so I have some English translations for you, and uh, I want to quote some of them because it is an utter disaster. So if that guy Gerhard Ludwig Müller is now the great salvation of the church because uh, he, you know, whatever, opposes the globalist uh, uh, agenda uh, of the World Economic Forum and, and so on. Uh, that's really saying a lot, okay? You have to understand, it's not enough to um, profess faith in most Catholic dogmas. You have to uh, believe and profess all of them. Um, and so a lot of people forget that, you know, and especially when it comes to life issues and issues pertaining to the sixth and ninth commandment very quickly uh you know people are like you know like oh well if you're if you're against abortion and you're um uh, you know for purity and 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 against you know homosexual this and that then well why then you must be orthodox well doesn't work that way so let me see uh some of the things muller has said and yes, we can include the link for that. I don't know how much of this I want to quote. It's I could quote a lot, but it is so, it really, it turns your brain into mush uh, in the end. So this is from his book. Uh, the, the title is translated as The Mass, Source of Christian Life. And I'm pretty sure this was published in 2002 two or, or thereabouts. Uh, in reality, so this is Miller speaking, body and blood of Christ do not mean the material components of the man Jesus during his lifetime or in his transfigured corporeality. Rather, body and blood here mean the presence of Christ in the sign of the medium of bread and wine, which presence is made communicable in the here and now of sense-bound human perception. Just as before Easter, the disciples were perceptibly together with Jesus by hearing his words and perceiving him in the sensory figure in accordance with human nature, we now have fellowship with Jesus Christ communicated through the eating and drinking of the bread and the wine. Now, does that sound like transubstantiation to you? Uh, I mean, see, he has an obligation to clearly teach transubstantiation and not to come up with his own concepts instead, right? right? Now, it's because somebody might say, well, uh, that's not clearly a denial of transubstantiation. That's not good enough. He has to clearly affirm it, okay? Um, here's some more uh, from the same book. The natural substance of these gifts of bread and wine does not consist in that which can be examined by natural science as the ultimate building block. The substance of these gifts can only be explained in their relation to man. 
Thus, the determination of substance must begin anthropologically. The natural substance of these gifts as the fruit of the earth and of human labor, as the integrity of a product of nature and culture, consists in showing clearly the nourishment and refreshment of man and the human community under the auspices of the common meal. Of course, these gifts are also an indication that our life and the preservation of our being depends upon God, which is why we feel we owe him our gratitude. These natural substances of bread and wine are converted by God in the sense that the substance of bread and wine now, meaning after the conversion, consists in indicating and bringing about the saving communion with God, which is given in the incarnation, cross, and resurrection of the Son of God and the sending of the Holy Ghost. In other words, the conversion of substance means that bread and wine go from being natural vehicles of communication to being a new way of supernatural communication between God and man with the goal of transmitting salvation, which occurred in Jesus Christ, in a real historical way. Christ, then, is really present in an objective sense because it is God alone who fixes the absolute horizon before which the reality of the world and history and the manner of his self-communication can be contemplated. Uh, Kevin, could you summarize for me, please? Uh... <laughs> I didn't Ooh. think so. Oh, my. And for, for those who think that, well, you're just not smart enough to understand all that, um, let me, let me um, give this piece of evidence. Uh, let's see, where is it? One second here. Uh, he, he's, uh, he's in Munich, isn't he? I think he's my local. No, he's in Rome. Oh, is he in Rome? Oh, okay. oh yeah, yeah. yeah. He's been in Rome before, before he went to Rome in 2012. That's when Ratzinger, Benedict XVI called him to be the head of the Holy Office there, what used to be the Holy Office. Um, uh, before then, he was in Regensburg in oh, Radisbon okay. in Germany. Got it. Yes. Huh. Um, okay, let me just find this one place. So let me see. So what Muller says, again, this is like an extra piece of evidence for those who think that, no, it's all transubstantiation is what he means or whatever. Uh, at some point, he says that the question at which precise point during mass the real presence comes about he says that to ask that question makes no sense okay so that right there is um tells you that whatever he's teaching it's not transubstantiation okay in fact i gave it the label this is just my label i gave it the label transcommunication um so uh, who knows what it is. But anyway, so this is what the man uh, believes about the Holy Eucharist. So, you know, I really don't care if he offers Mass uh, using the 1962 Missal, okay? This man is not a Catholic. And uh, I don't know if you'd like to hear more. I think we're good, though, right? <laughs> I, I, The point came across to me loud and clear. <laughs> Yeah, that yeah, this is not a mean, hero of the Catholic Church. Um, hang on, there's this one part about where he mentions a dialogue that I find uh, in interesting. Uh, oh, wait, that's the pro point. Never mind. I found the point that I wanted to quote about the at which, at what point, uh, at what exact moment the the um, the conversion of body and blood uh, of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. At what moment that takes place? So this is also from the Mass Source of Christian Life. He says. So this is all a quote. There still remains to be clarified a question which has arisen in the history of theology concerning the exact moment this sacred conversion of bread and wine into real signs of the salvific communication with God in Jesus Christ. Uh, at, at, at what point that takes place. It is the calling down of the Holy Ghost, which in the liturgy... Oh, excuse me, he's asking... Is it the calling down of the Holy Ghost, which in the liturgy of the Eastern churches mostly takes place after the institution narrative? Or is it the recitation of the words of institution of Jesus itself which affects the conversion? It will not be necessary to answer the question the one way or the other, because the question does not really make sense theologically. 
The conversion, which is part of the fundamentals of the Catholic faith in the Eastern and Western Church, occurs through the incorporation of the sacrificial gifts into the dialogue of Father, Son, and Spirit. This is the content of the three parts of the prayer following the preface, in which the Father is addressed in the communication of the Son and the Holy Ghost. By including the gifts of bread and wine into this action of triune love, which in salvation history actualized itself to our benefit, they become for us the body and blood of Christ. You know what? Get out of here. Just, just, just leave. Okay. The, so anyway, congratulations, Michael Matt. You got to interview Cardinal Gerhard Ludwig Muller. No doubt this is a sign that our Lord is in charge of the Vatican II Church. <sighs> it, it's, it's fairly embarrassing, isn't it? I, I don't know. I just find myself kind of you know, like, dude. Um, in, in, in 2012. Calm down. When, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, the, the, I remember in 2012 when the Society of St. Pius X was very was very unhappy with Muller being uh, becoming head of, chief of the doctrine of the faith uh, in the Vatican, and mm -hmm. uh, of course Muller it was very antagonistic towards the SSPX, and um, yeah, just just don't make the mistake of thinking the man is a Catholic just because now he's against homo couple blessings and stuff like that, and against synodality and and, and stuff. I mean, at this they're so far. Well, actually. Wait, this is regard, with regard to Germany, like the Sinnel way in Germany, which is another can of worms. Hmm. Uh, th that thing is so bad now that even Cardinal Walter Casper uh, is starting to sound orthodox by comparison. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to, it just, it, it really is great for a study in relativity. Um, how many, how many modernists, how many novels ordos uh, are suddenly sounding orthodox simply because they're not as far gone as some of the others, right? Um, okay, so I got two more here, uh, two more clips. Uh, please go to 3528 and play, play it until 3647. So this is actually... 3528, you think? Yeah, 3528 through 3647. This is where uh, Matt says that, well, let, let's just let him talk traditional catholic movement because you know what it did it took every one of us off the hook and he knows it because he's the prince of the church and he understands how oh, weighty it is when he says something like this it took every one of us off the hook how do we resist are we being uh, you know more catholic than the pope well that's not hard to do anymore but you know what i mean <laughs> and we have these problems and we, we go into we have conscience issues how can we resist without becoming Martin Luther and becoming Protestants, and this is terrible, what are we going to do? That's been going on for 50 years, and rightfully so. People trying to figure out, what is resistance? Well, I'm just a Catholic. I just, want to, I just want to live out my faith and hand it down to my sons as it was handed down to me from my fathers, right? But when, when Cardinal Muller, God bless him, when he said that, and we must resist, now we will have recourse when we stand before the divine judgment seat of Almighty God. We will say there were cardinals, there were bishops, there were core bishops who said, we must resist. And so let's just do it. Let's just give them hell. Let's just resist them. Yeah, keep going. Another 20 seconds or so. Oh, sorry. With let's give everything them hell. that we have, so the rightful authority in the Catholic Church, recognizing the traditional Catholic laity, the movement, stands with them, rightful authority. We stand with rightful authority, and we wait for God to work through the rightful authority in the church to correct his church. To bring the church back to where she, where she, where she should be, where she must be, because she's divine, and God's going to save His church, it's not us. Yeah. Okay. So, well, great. So the church is divine, but somehow it needs correction. Right. Okay. And and uh, okay. So w what he said here is uh, just to recap that now that even Cardinal Muller is resisting and telling us to resist, now we're off the hook because now we can say we have bishops and you know cardinals and all that. Um, last time I checked, it's not the bishop or the cardinal you're supposed to follow, but the pope, okay? Um, you can't say, well, a cardinal told me to resist the pope. Uh, well, and the pope told you not to listen to him, right? It's, it doesn't make any sense. And, um, you know, 
the, what are the Novus Ordos going to say? Well, because, you know, they also have cardinals on their side, like Supich and McElroy and, oh, yeah, and the Pope. They even have a Pope on their side, so they're off the hook. I, I mean, this, you just wonder, like, do, do these people never think about what they're saying? Um, yeah, now he says, well, we stand with rightful authority. Actually... <laughs> Actually, it's the other way around. He's happy because rightful authority, what he calls rightful authority, is now standing with them. See, that's right. really how this is, right? Um, and because, you know, they're standing where they were standing 10, 20 years ago. And it just now it ha so happens that a few of them, uh, a few of the rightful authority people have joined them. Okay. So now he's turning around and saying, hey, look, we're standing with rightful authority. That's so. I guess it's dishonest. I mean, I don't know. At least I, I don't think he, he realized what he was saying there, but it's just not true because remember when, wh where was rightful authority when um, Archbishop Lefebvre uh, was declared excommunicated? Well, wasn't the rightful authority declaring the excommunication? Where were they standing there? Well, they were standing with Archbishop Lefebvre. I, I mean, it's just, I'm sorry, it's just not honest. It's not, it's, it's just theologically, it's a disaster and uh, so, well, you know, if you want to stand with rightful authority, how about you stand with the supreme one, right? Supreme supreme authority in the Catholic Church is the Pope. Um, well, well, it just shows you that, that it's exactly that they, it's the church that they want it to be. It's like their own created thing. It's like, okay, yeah, I think you said it exactly right. Well, now they have a cardinal on their side, quote unquote. So now all of a sudden their we're invoking the church. Authority. Exactly. So it's like, so it's like, well, now since they're with us and what we believe the church to be, then now we have something, you know, that exactly that kind of yes. you know lessens the load a little bit. But that, that's an insane thought. Exactly. I mean it's just saying the church is what I consider it to be rather than the church is of course what we've been you know what we've been told and what we've been taught for thousands of years with the yeah. Pope as and, have, and there have always been wayward cardinals right um i'm really bad on church history so please forgive me if i'm getting this wrong but wasn't cardinal wools was it woolsey wasn't wasn't he the one against saint thomas more right and against the pope yeah what, what what i mean can you imagine all these uh people uh you know torn between well do we risk our lives and go with the Pope or do we stick with the, the I mean, everybody else says that the, the King of England is now the head of the church and I kind of want to leave my head attached to my neck. Uh, so, you know, um, we've got a Cardinal on our side. Right. Right. Um, and it, actually, you know, this is a really a very sobering reminder of how serious these things are and of how frail uh, all of us really are because you know, if you think of the Catholic Church in England before the Anglican schism, uh, you had all these priests and, and all these uh, laymen and all these other clerics, and they, you know, I'm assuming they were just average, like, uh, you know, most most people, uh, you know, average clerics. They, they weren't, uh, uh, you know, bad or anything. But when it came time then to decide between the king or the pope, Almost all of them chose the king. It's scary. Because, you know, they not be not because they were malicious, probably, but because they were afraid. And they wanted to save their lives and thus lost it instead of losing their lives. So as to save it. Um it's very sobering. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there. Um okay, last one. 36. Oh, I guess you know what? Uh no, I think we already had, I, I just had made another, um, noted another reference and just realized that we already covered that. Um, yeah, so it's, um, you know, Michael Matt says, well, God's going to save the church, not us. Okay. But somehow he, he doesn't find that argument convincing when it comes to the state of accountism, I guess. I, beats me. So when I, when I listened to that uh, speech, by Michael Mann, I just thought it it needed uh, some commentary, and uh, I'm sure a lot more could be said. But uh, you know, what irks me is that it is such bad theology, and it is so poorly argued, and yet it gets all the attention. That's very tragic. Um, well, and I think it's a it's a boy. What a lesson it is to 
to remember that our faith is not based on emotions. It's not based on rah rah speeches. It's not based on, hey, this feels good. This sounds good. This is what I want. No, it's based on theology. It's based on truth and tradition passed down from Christ and the apostles and the popes. And, and that's, I think the nice thing about that is that I think if if we can come to that conclusion and say, okay, if I can, you know, it, it's actually up here, you know, rather than 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 what I feel. That's a that's a that's a pretty comforting thought, I think, that you could, because I mean, if you go and actually read the teachings of the church and read what the popes, read the encyclicals, as you said, way, even way back when, you're just going to see, first of all, that the Nova Sordo cannot be the Catholic Church. I mean, it, it's very yeah. clear that it, it is a totally different thing, re, different religion, and that, that's really obvious. And something very clear that popes over and over and over and over teach is that the, the papacy is infallible and that the, the, the papacy and the church cannot lead people into error. It's just, you, you can't believe these two things. If you read these documents of the church, the, the, the papacy is always safe to follow, right? It must be. Otherwise God couldn't command you to be, to be subject to the Pope. Um, and so, you know, and that doesn't mean everything the Pope says or does or whatever is infallible. It doesn't mean that, right. but it does mean that the, um, the official acts of the papal magisterium uh, will always be safe for you to adhere to, right? You will never endanger your soul by doing that, which only makes sense. And that is what, you know, it's a beautiful thing. It's the divine assistance, um, which let me actually quote uh, Pope Pius XI from the encyclical Casti Canubii. Let's see if I can... And it's here, I'm sure I can. There it is. So he says here, because so Costi Canubii was on Christian marriage and uh, was issued in 1930. And the Pope was anticipating the objection that, well, the Pope is here, you know, saying something about what is and isn't lawful in marriage. And that, that that's that's not that's not an ex cathedra thing, you know. Um, so he uh, applies the 11th here in paragraph 104 says the following wherefore let the faithful also be on their guard against the overrated independence of private judgment and that false autonomy of human reason for it is quite foreign to everyone bearing the name of a christian to trust his own mental powers with such pride as to agree only with those things which he can examine from their inner nature and to imagine that the church sent by God to teach and guide all nations is not conversant with present affairs and circumstances, or even that they must obey only in those matters which she has decreed by solemn definition as though her other decisions might be presumed to be false or putting forward insufficient motive for truth and honesty. Quite to the contrary, a characteristic of all true followers of Christ, lettered or unlettered, is to suffer themselves to be guided and led in all things that touch upon faith or morals by the Holy Church of God through its supreme pastor, the Roman pontiff, who is himself guided by Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that, that is a beautiful quote from Pius XI, uh, the encyclical Casti Canubii, which, by the way, is a very popular encyclical among traditional Catholics. So everybody is probably probably has a copy somewhere or knows uh, where to get one. It's recorded uh, on Catholic Family Podcast, too. So you can go listen to Okay, it. perfect. Is it really? It is. Whole great, time. great. Yes. So the, 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 the long and the short of it is, if you read the old papal encyclicals and other magisterial acts, there's no way you can believe that the Vatican II sect is the Roman Catholic Church or that uh, the people who have led the Vatican II sect since 1958 are genuine vicars of Christ and popes of the Catholic Church. It's just, it's an impossibility. It has nothing to do with a pay grade. Uh, it's it, You just can't do it. So uh, that's all I had here. I hope this was somewhat informative. Uh, yeah, somewhat. You know, I guess we'll, we'll put up with you for if, if you want to come back on some other time. <laughs> no, yeah. no, I greatly appreciate it. And, and I think, and I think again, as, as we, we both have said, we both know that again, it's not a personal attack. It's not like, Oh, Michael, Matt, we don't like this guy. No, it's, it's just like, well, listen to his own words. And then, you know, you can pick him apart pretty easily as Mario just did for the last hour and a half. So, I mean, it's, you know, and, and I think, yeah. I think it's, it's important to, yeah, to be aware of these things and to know that, well, some of these guys are, you know, 
spouting stuff that's not necessarily true. Well, yeah. if you guys want to go check out more of Mario's stuff, NovaSortOfWatch.org, of course, I think you, you guys probably all know that by now. Tradcast.org as well. That's where he puts up his um, podcast. Um, fairly regular, I suppose. Not, not like regularly posted. It's not like every Monday or something, but it, it's you get right. them up pretty often these days. Uh, I try to have at least an express podcast, like a short podcast, at least every at least every 14 days. Um, yeah. and you know, the, the problem is what makes everything so difficult is, um, of course my main activity is the blog at novelsordowatch.org. But what makes it so difficult is that in order to put a, some quality content together, you have to sit down and focus on that and do the research and, you know, make it worth people's while, while at the same time, you still have to keep up with what's going on every day, the daily chaos. Right. And oftentimes you know, you, you want to do one thing and finish it. And in the meantime, already six other big breaking news stories uh, have interrupted and uh, also need to be covered or need some kind of reaction. That's what makes it difficult to to get stuff out more more frequently. Well, we had a news break at the beginning of the show. So it's a good, ex ex good really good That's example right. of we planned this show, and then right before, like, hey, can I? Can we actually start the show with a news break? So it's a proof and proof and point. But but again, yeah, go check it out, NovaSotoWatch.org. And please, again, if you're watching this on Mario's channel at NovaSotoWatch, um, head on over to Catholic Family Podcast and subscribe there as well. Like, share, subscribe, comment, and, and please do share this with your R and R friends because we we want that's that's who we do want to watch this and kind of see, you know, okay, right. there is there are issues in what's being said in, in this theology. And we, we just want them to see the truth. We want them to, to follow, you know, what the church has taught. And that's of course what we hope for as well. Pray for us, pray for Mario and, and for what he does and, and go over there and support him. And uh, thank you so much, yeah. Mario until next time. God bless. Okay. You. Take care everyone. God bless.